that this discovery was co-opted by Big Bang ideologists as evidence for a cosmic entropy. Relativist metaphysics succeeded in keeping its cake and eating it too. Such are the privileges of theories that become part of the organon of royal science. In the experiments and theories of physics, they are curse experiments voted to systematic oblivion. Two such examples are the 1913 Sanyak and the 1925 Michelson Gale Pearson experiments, which to this day remain wild- welded together as the repressed of general relativity. <laughs> <laughs> that the MGP experiment was voted to oblivion is all the more glaring an omission since it was supposed to provide a test for Einstein's principle of equivalence of inertial and gravitational masses, the actual basis for general relativity. Okay. It was supposed to provide a test for inertial and gravitational equivalence. Yeah, 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 okay. The relativistic expectation sanctioned by Einstein in 1924 was that the MGP experiment should detect a full friend shift in order to confirm general relativity, whereas a null result would have been incompatible with the notion of a partial ether drag. Okay. Would have been compatible with the notion of a partial ether drag. Note that the expectations regarding the null result had now been inverted with respect to the Michelson-Morley experiment because the michelson gale pearson experiment tested for rotation and not translation of the Earth, so argued Einstein. In this context, right, 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 because they expected a null result because relativity, but now they expect a full drag because relativity, I see. So in this context, <laughs> yeah. because rotation yeah, dude, versus you're, translation. Dude, dude, you're getting it. <laughs> in this context, the authors wonder why should rotation be measurable because of a space-time, because of a space-time drag of inertial frames in rotation, and translation remain unmeasurable and unstable to elicit the dragging of its own inertial frame, when translation is also a gravitational motion and there must be equivalence in principle between inertial and non-inertial frames. Oh my gosh. That whole sentence. The problem is further highlighted by GR's later confrontation in the early 1930s with the 1913 Sanyak effect because GR is here constrained to admit that for non-inertial frames, the speed of light is no longer constant. What? Yeah, that's what that's what Bennett was talking about earlier. So I didn't put this together, but the implication is that when you're in curved space-time, the speed of light is accelerating. After all, to be consistent with itself, as Aspton has pointed out, relativity should have followed Mach's lead and proposed that one should not be able to electromagnetically measure any speed of rotation with respect to space. To achieve this somersault, Einstein adopted the relativistic dragging of inertial frames from ether drag theory. The dragging of the frame? What? Yeah, I don't I don't even know what frame dragging thing is. Apparently there's this guy named uh that Thuring Thurling guy or Thuring that was mentioned earlier. He's got uh-huh. he's associated with the drag stuff. It's like uh I forget what it's called. It's like a Thur- Thuring Thuring drag or something like that. But it's like this I, I don't know. I I have to look into it. But um that's what, it, what it's associated with. And even with. went <laughs> as far as claiming in 1920 that with general relativity, the conception of the ether has again acquired an intelligible content, although this content differs widely from that of the ether of the mechanical undulatory theory of light. But did Einstein's trajectory remain loyal to this program? The authors contend that it did not. Central to the GR paradox was the axiomatic assumption that gravitational field energy can be treated as reducible to the interval metric structure of space-time itself. From an energeticist perspective, this was an essential metaphysical lapse, emptying gravitation of its energetic content and replacing it with the structure of a manifold that is susceptible to the criticism that it essentially confuses time with space. Moreover, there is no intrinsic or heuristic requirement on the part of the Sanyak effect for any time dilation transformations. Einstein was, in fact, obliged to treat the continuum as a pseudo-Riemannian manifold that had a separate physical reality distinct from the spatio-temporal relations between material objects. How embarrassing. Had a separate physical reality that was distinct from the space and time relations between material objects. So the continuum 
the manifold that he invoked had a separate physical reality that was distinctly different from the space-time relations between objects that you know are physical. This clearly introduced substantivalist considerations into what was originally deemed to be a relationist project. These considerations lead one to become suspicious of Einstein's utterances about an ether compatible with relativity. The problem is that the ether that Einstein increasingly appeared to have in mind, rather than becoming, as promised, a non-material, non-mechanical, and gravitational ether, turned instead into a pure metaphysical fiction, a disembodied spatial reality endowed solely with a mathematical existence and barred from any access to time and synchronicity. Damn. Einstein operated... He's a savage. <laughs> Einstein operated a reduction of gravitational theory to geometry and ultimately precluded, therefore, any recourse to the notion of gravitational energy. He operated a reduction of the gravitational theory to mere geometry and precluded any recourse, any... Wow, to the... Oh, gosh. Okay. With this mystification, rotation was indeed made to appear as a mystery of nature. Ha ha! <laughs> oh, my gosh. Good boy. Subsequent evolution of relativistic cosmology at the hands of Einstein's successors have resurrected the problem of absolute motion and the measurement of peculiar velocity with respect to the cosmic microwave background radiation, a cosmic universal frame of reference for the propagation of electromagnetic energy has been found in direct contravention of special relativity, yet as soon as it was made, this discovery was co-opted by Big Bang ideologists as evidence for a cosmic entropy. Relativist metaphysics, metaphysics succeeded in keeping its cake and eating it too. Such are the privileges of theories that become part of the organon of, of, royal, of royal science. Royal science. Classical theory tends to start out with charge as a source of electric fields, whereas relativity pulls fields out from nowhere by the magic of abstract transformations of reference frames. H. Aspton, Modern Ether Science, 1972, page 85. Huh. This guy gets it. We're going to have to take a look at this dude's book. <laughs> he gets it. The MGP experiment is a test of general relativity, Einstein's ambivalence. There are some experiments. Yeah, we read that first paragraph already. In a, another omission. Yeah, the MGP. Uh, oh, wait. No, no, we didn't read this. There are some experiments in the history and theory of physics which are systematically ignored. One such glaring omission is the 1913 Sanyak experiment, whose principle and effect are today used in the ring laser gyro applied to sub submarine and satellite navigation. And another significant omission is the mickelson gale pearson MGP experiment, which was supposed to provide proper verification of Einstein's general relativity in accordance with Silberstein's proposal. The omission of the MGP experiment is all the more... It's so red. Can you, like, change the color to anything else? I it's so hard to read. I can't on this one, though. That's the the omission of the like MGP that. experiment is all the more glaring as that it was supposed to provide a test for Einstein's principle of equivalence, the actual basis for GR, which posits the equality of inertial mass and gravitational mass. And this is precisely the excuse that textbooks on the matter utilize to ignore the MGP experiment, that it falls outside the scope of special relativity and can only be addressed by general relativity. In this vein, AP's French AP French's MIT course and textbook on special relativity did not even mention the MGP or the Sanyak experiments even once. That looks better. Oh. What's that? that? That's better. This argument can certainly be seen as specious if we consider that, strictly speaking, the MGP, exper MGP experiment has never been cited as an experimental confirmation of general relativity, not even by Einstein when he enumerated towards the end of his life the three major tests of general relativity as being the oval orbit of Mercury, the bending of light rays in a gravitational field, which he considered confirmed by the English solar eclipse expedition, and the spectral redshift. However, around the general relativity theory, Einstein elaborated a series of considerations on gravity waves and the gravitational ether which were not really part of GR, but in fact straddled his attempts to develop a unified field theory. Be that as it may, the question that awakens one's attention is, why should relativity, GR, when predicting the outcome of the MGP experiment, expect a positive friendship with regard to the rotation of the Earth, whereas beforehand, as a special theory, SR, 
it had based its axiomatic assumptions upon the null result of the Michelson-Morley experiment with regard to translation of the Earth. So he's like, why are they expe expecting a full fringe when it rotates, but a no fringe when it translates? Back in 1924, because like th those are contradictory to each other, right? Mm -hmm. Back in 1924, the relativistic expectation as proposed by Silberstein and sanctioned by Einstein was indeed that the MGP experiment should detect a full fringe shift if it were to confirm relativity, whereas a null result would have been compatible with the notion of a partial ether drag. The expectations regarding the null result had been inverted with respect to the Michelson Morley experiment because the MGP keep in mind, experiment tested. I'm oh, sorry, real quick, that partial ether drag to provide the null was them saying that the ether would bounce around in the tube and carry the velocity in the opposite directions. Well, Silberstein specifically said null or partial velo partial fringe. He said a, a fringe less with a K value of less than one. Yeah, it was just uh, like, how could you even mechanistically have a zero fringe if there's an ether? And it's like, you can't unless you're like retarded. Right. Make, zero, make up, that's what I would think. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. What's a partial drag of zero? The major difference between the MGP experiment and the MM experiment is that the MGP experiment utilized a fixed interferometer rather than a rotating one, measuring a four-way propagation measuring a four-way propagation of light around a very long rectangular pathway. The east-west legs were 612 meters long, north-south 339. Since there was no rotation of the observer, the latter remained fixed to the revolving frame of the Earth. Hmm. The outcome of the MGP experiment was ambiguous, though one, though maybe no more ambiguous than the small persistent positive shift observed in Michelson-Morley experiments, composed of 269 separate tests with readings that varied from negative 0.04 to 0.55 of a fringe and a mean at 0.26 fringes. The MGP experiment could be interpreted to yield a positive result of about 0.3 kilometers per second. Therefore, near the speed of the Earth's rotation, but the result was of borderline significance. It could be said that the experiment was inconclusive because it adduced neither proof that there was a shift in the phase of the light beams, nor that there wasn't one. Scroll up a little bit. With his typical inclination towards ambiguity, Mickelson concluded that the result may be explained on the hypothesis of an ether fixed in space, but may also be interpreted as one more confirmation of Einstein's theory of relativity. <laughs> his typical inclination towards ambiguity, Mickelson. Huh. This was a major ambivalence on Mickelson's part, and one which might appear to justify, justify Einstein's reservations about Mickelson's own understanding of the problems at stake, were it not for the fact that Einstein himself was subject to a comparable ambivalent oscillation. Indeed, why should GR predict that rotation was optically measurable but not translation? The question is all the more poignant as Ernst Mach, whose work was considered by Einstein himself to be the forerunner of relativity, had suggested precisely this postulate on the basis of what he saw to be the impossibility of distinguishing whether the Earth rotated or was immobile and the stars alone circled the Earth. This undiscernibility and equivalence was the basis for postulating the relativity of all motion with respect to the motion of other material bodies. And with the cardinal assumption, which Einstein elaborated into the first guiding principle of SR. When Mach had, enumerated, had enunciated this principle with respect to rotation, it did not yet constitute a complete break with classical thought, exactly because rotation was considered to form a bad and forbidden system of coordinates to employ Einstein's and Infeld's expression in their criticism of classical kinematics. And <laughs> A non <laughs> dude, is what? That real? Yeah, dude, they were griping about kinematics. Like relativity is, is based all on kinematics. That's crazy. Einstein, however, applied Mach's principle to translation, where the frame is directly considered to be inertial. Why then, when Einstein returned to the problematics of gravitation and rotation, should he choose to invert Mach's original proposition by suggesting that? Whereas with SR, the absence of fringe shift in the Michelson Morley experiment was explained by Mach's principle, GR should predict the fringe shifts for the MGP experiment in apparent contradiction with Mach's principle. To many authors, herein lies a clear indication of the fundamental ambivalence of relativity regarding the physics of a non inertial ro rotating frame. After all, to be consistent with itself, as Aspenden correctly pointed out in his Physics Unified, Relativity should have followed Mach's lead and concluded that there should be no way to measure, optically or electromagnetically, the speed of rotation, or even detect the rotation of a body with respect to space. 
if with general relativity Einstein had attempted to demonstrate that the fundamental laws of physics ought to be the same in inertial and non-inertial or revolving frames of reference, why should inertial frames be un unable to optically measure their translation, but non-inertial frames be able to measure their rotation? The question is all the more poignant as Newton's law of gravitation was easily deduced from Kepler's laws of planetary, planetarian translation, but remained disconnected from planetarian rotation. Because, uh, he, yeah, he said MGP, inertial frame, unable to measure for translation. Newton's gravity laws deduce Kepler's laws of translation. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, the circular Galilean or elliptico Keplerian motion of the planets must be considered to be just as much a form of angular motion as planetary rotation is. The only possible way for Einstein to explain the seeming contradiction between the presuppositions of SR and those of GR would have been to assume that C is referred to the inertial axis of the Earth for purposes of translation and thus permits detection of rotation with respect to the same non-revolving axis, but, as we shall shortly see, that's not the route he took. In fact, the route Einstein embarked upon was a tortuous one, uh, utilizing elements that, strictly speaking, were outside of general relativity to define space as the domain of a gravitational ether, only to end up in a geometric formalism of a space-time that serves as an empty container defined by an elastic tensegrity of intervals. But, because relativity in its restricted form had largely discarded the problem of rotation from consideration of the null effect of the Michelson-Morley type experiments, it could appear to be consistent with both electromagnetic detectability of rotation and undetectability of translation, and thus appear to withstand not only this contradiction, but also its own ambivalence with regard to the detectability or undetectability of rotation. It discarded the problem of rotation from consideration of the null effect of Michelson-Morley. Discarded the problem of rotation. Oh, he, so when it came to rotation, it, he discarded the problem of rotation from the consideration of, of Mickelson Morley's null. Like he was, he would not look at them in, with respect to each other. And by not looking at them with respect to each other and noticing the, con like pointing out the contradiction or acknowledging it, he could appear to be consistent with detectability of rotation and undetectability of translation and appear to withstand the contradiction and his own but Okay, yeah. He just didn't consider it. He just ignored it. <laughs> what a long, what a, what a, what a long-winded way to say he ignored it. <laughs> <laughs> the ensuing confusion amongst physicists was so deep that the results of the MGP experiment could advantageously be seen to confirm Einstein's relativity with respect to rotational motion Irrespective of the outcome of the experiment, what? As well as, as and just as well, appeared to confirm the adequacy of Michelson's method to detect the rotary deflection predicted by ether theory. While relativity was satisfied with the negative result with respect to translation, it was nearly indifferent to the results ob obtained with respect to rotation. These amb this ambiguous situation was reflected in the ranks of relativists. Those who believed that the positive result from the MGP experiment was significant, like Silberstein, would argue that all it proved was that the Earth rotates in its axis, precisely what Foucault's pendulum had demonstrated. Those who believed that the experiment was non-significant, like A. Compton, would conclude that the Earth's rotation had no effect on the speed of light, and that the MGP experiment had definitely disproved the ether drag hypothesis and confirmed relativity. What? The latter view has, to, has today become the accepted one, and most discussions of the speed of light test ignore the Michelson-Gale Pearson experiment and feel justified in doing so. Jaffa, in his book Michelson and the Speed of Light, gives the matter one paragraph in which he does not even report the findings. Wow. However, at the time, in 1925, the lines were not yet drawn in the sand, and the perplexed and ambivalent state of physicists and relativists alike was translated by the famous New York Times headline of January 9, 1925. Michelson proves Einstein theory. Ether drift is confirmed. Rays found to travel at different speeds when sent in opposite directions. The paradox could not have been greater. <laughs> <laughs> shout, out to, shout out to the New York Times. Now, do you think they did that on purpose? They were like... I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Clout. Here, you can have them both. His theory and some ether drift. It's both, guys. 
for the pro par for the problem is that if general relativity is to uphold optical detectability of rotation, even arguing that the inertial frame of reference of rotary motion is the non-revolving axis of the Earth, which therefore precludes optical trans detectability of translation, it must accept the notion of an ether, albeit a non-stationary one. We have seen that Einstein was so inclined. And this likely explains what appears to be a contradiction between the predictions of SR and GR, as his own attempt at relativizing special relativity itself. <laughs> relativizing relativity itself. Indeed, one could read into this aspect of GR the requirement that an ether must exist, an ether which is in a state of rotation around the planet and is nearly synchronous with the rotation of the planet, a concept akin to that of Stokes' etherosphere, but involving not a drag caused by translation but an actual rotating ether envelope propell propelling the Earth forward. Yet, for reasons altogether obscure, Einstein's thought after 1926 made a complete U-turn with respect to this problem, and he ended up by embracing the phenomenological postulates underlying the special theory, an em effectively empty space occupied by a gravitational field that only in principle is independent from matter, as being the very foundations for a field unification which was, even in his own estimation, unsuccessful. It is in this sense that Arthur Compton was ultimately correct. If the results of the NGP experiment are or were to be considered significant, they could never be seen as proving Einstein's theory. What was consistent with Mach's principle was the complete inability of an, ob observer, of an observer to detect either his rotation or his translation by optical reference to a fixed ether. Hence... For Arthur Compton, the MGP experiment presented a non-significant phase difference and therefore confirmed relativity because there was no ether drag that could or should be invoked. When, with the triumph of this view, a new set of rules had insidiously crept into the game. Relativity now required a null result in both the Michelson-Morley and the michelson gill pearson experiments, and the door was closed on the matter of the ether. The ratio of two of the masses of two bodies is defined in mechanics in two ways which differ from each other fundamentally. In the first place is the reciprocal ratio of the accelerations which the same motive force imparts to them, their inert mass. And in, the, and in the second place as the ratio of the forces which act upon them and the same gravitational field, gravitational mass. It is only when there is a numerical equality between the inert and gravitational mass that the acceleration is independent of the nature of the body. Einstein, the meaning of relativity. In Newtonian physics, we learn that all bodies, independent of their mass, density, or weight, fall towards the Earth with the same acceleration. That is, if air were absent so that the Archimedes' law of buoyancy could not apply, a feather and a ton of lead would fall with the same acceleration, free fall being proportional to the mass of each body. Newton's second law postulates that if force is constant, acceleration decreases the mass of a body increases. But with respect to terrestrial gravity, a body twice the weight of another will have twice the force of gravity pulling it down. As weight and mass effects will cancel each other, gravitational acceleration will be the same or constant in all cases. Released from the same height and in the absence of air, the feather and the ton of lead should reach the ground at the same time. Newton formalized this relation in the law of gravitational attraction between the masses of two bodies. F equals G mm over R squared. Where F G equals the gravitational force. G is a, okay, 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 okay. As the force exerted on an object with inertial mass m is f equals ma, or the product of inertial mass times acceleration we obtain on the condition that gravitational and inertial mass should be the same, the following equation. gmm over r squared equals ma, which resolves to gm over r squared equals a. In other words, the acceleration of an object under the acceleration of a gravitational field is independent of the mass of the object. Having arrived at this conclusion, Newtonian mechanics does not explore it further. But relativity holds that a gravitational force of attraction expressed by downward motion, free fall, is equivalent for all bodies, regardless of mass, to a comparable upward linear acceleration of any inertial frame, the elevator analogy, in a gravitational field. Both approaches, gravitational and inertial, to the phenomenon of the free fall of mass are equivalent. This yeah. thought experiment were... They um, just are they just canceling out the mass and then the acceleration is a ratio of the constants? Yeah, the acceleration is, is just, just a result of the gravitational field. It doesn't depend on the mass of the object falling. Wow, so it's literally the same thing over again. That's so crazy. 
This thought experiment where effectively this axiomatization equates therefore gravitational motion with acceleration of inertial frames of reference. So, the bottom line of GR's principle of equivalence is that an accelerating reference frame is equivalent to an inertial frame upon which a gravitational field has been imposed. Phenomenologically, GR proposes that there is no way to distinguish between the weight m that wants to remain behind due to inertia when its frame of reference moves upward and the weight m being pulled down because of its heaviness, gravitational mass. If the weight of a body is distinct from its mass, that is, if weight is but the effective attraction of this mass by the Earth, far from the Earth, the body would still have mass, but its weight would be negligible, then it is the mass that determines the weight of the body once a gravitational field is given. Since this defines gravitational or heavy mass, inert mass simply becomes the property of resistance to changes in motion. Heavier or volumetrically denser mass may have a stronger downward pull than lighter mass, yet at the same time the pull has to carry or displace a greater inert mass, hence the fall is not any faster. So because inert and heavy mass are the same, no distinction between accelerated motion and gravitation can be made in general relativity. The problematics raised by the michelson morley experiment affects not only restricted theory of relativity, but also general relativity as it raises the whole question of the equivalence between revolving and inertial or translating frames. Moreover, if the michelson morley experiment cannot be truly considered as a test of SR, the MGP experiment was intended, was intended specifically as a test of GR. The peculiarity of the inverse positions of relativity vis-a-vis -vis translation and rotation finds its roots in the fact that for restricted relativity, a negative result of the Michelson-Morley experiment was consistent with the notion that the Earth's translatory motion through space could not be detected, but it was inconsistent with Newtonian mechanics, specifically with Newton's second law and his law of gravitation. If objects attracted each other with a force that depended on the distance between them, and if action at a distance were true non-locality of action, then the gravitational force could not be subject to the limitation imposed by the speed of light, as enunciated by special relativity, but now generalized to gravitational fields by GR. This, of course, raises the problem of the propagation of the gravitic interaction and its relationship with the propagation of electromagnetic disturbances. Dude, he's saying that gravity would have to travel, no, the influence of gravity could, would have a speed limit being the speed of light because general relativity extended relativist, rel relativity to gravitational fields and Newton's action at a distance doesn't have a time variable. So it's like instantaneous spooky action at a distance, but in general relativity, it's, it's uh, in, with respect to time and so yeah. the ratio against the speed of light. Dude, and on top of that, that's why that's why LIGO is so important for them to confirm gravitational waves because of that set setting that speed limit for gravity right is like supposed to be one of the ways that they've confirmed GR and all that like this, that's why it's important to them to but bolster there, that there can't <laughs> be a speed limit for gravity because then mm -hmm. everything would lag behind how dare you though but that's literally in there that's that's uh that's the crowning achievement of it. <laughs> is that they confirm that uh, that speed. <laughs> In this respect, GR also makes a set of assumptions which can be dissected as follows. The local equivalence of gravity with acceleration of inertial coordinate systems is considered in the context of a curved extension of flat 4D pseudo-Euclidean Minkowski space-time to obtain a pseudo riemannian manifold described by a set of tensors that preserve the interval metric and the spatialization of time. Adding space to time. Accordingly, just as the invariant C applies to the propagation of electromagnetic field disturbances for all inertial frames in uniform translation, so does it apply to the propagation of gravitational field disturbances in variant C and gravitational field. Here, GR predicts the existence of gravitational waves or field radiation propagating at speed C. Point masses under no other influence but that of gravitation follow time-like geodesics, whereas light rays under the same conditions form null geodesics of space-time. It is the deviation of particles from their time-like geodesics which give rise to inertial effects, a rehabilitation of the Newtonian motion or notion that it is the deviation from straight-line motion by an acceleration which produces inertial forces. To this set of evident assumptions, GR couples a, a set of hidden or intrinsic assumptions which bear closer scrutiny. The most important of these are, one, the axiomatic assumption that gravitational field energy can be treated not only as being ruled by the limit C as an invariant absolute velocity of propagation, what? 
but far more fundamentally as reducible to the interval metric structure of space-time itself. From an energeticist perspective, this is an essential metaphysical lapse. Emptying gravitation of its energetic content and replacing it with the structure of a manifold, which is susceptible to the criticism that it essentially confuses time with space. The whole theory also forsakes the Machian designs of true relationism by becoming susceptible to the criticism that it forms, confuses energy and its effects with an axiomatic form of the continuum. Two, the betrayal of Machian hopes is made final by the fact that in GR, the structure of the manifold is not determined exclusively by mass energy distribution. The distribution of mass energy in the universe contributes to the determination of the space time metric structure, but the metric itself has axiomatic constraints of its own. This relativistic somersault still more fundamentally raises the question of why classical physics should have considered rotation as forming a quote unquote forbidden system of coordinates devoid of equivalence with inertial systems. SR established that the laws and concepts of physics are the same for all inertial frames, each inertial frame of reference describing any event with its own set of numbers. As there is no extra special frame, no absolute point of reference, all inertial frames in relative uniform motion must yield the same physical laws. So why should the laws of physics not apply to non-inertial frames of reference, such as revolving frames or frames subject to acceleration and deceleration? Huh. This question has a direct bearing upon the MGP experiment, for an observer on a merry-go-round will not be able to deduce the equivalent laws of physics since its frame of reference is non-inertial and allows one to argue that Newton's first law does not apply, as in rotating bodies the direction of velocity is constantly changing. Yet so argues GR, it is possible to describe the same laws of physics from the rotating observer's viewpoint if one postulates that what is revolving is not the true observer, but the rest of the world around him. This is what Mach was getting at with his principle of the relativity of motion. Now, this was precisely the ostensive point of Einstein's assault on the matter with his proposal of a generalized relativity, yet paradoxically what the theory ended up doing was to axiomatically establish the absolute character of, gro- gravita- of rotation. The, yeah, the theory ended up... What the theory ended up doing was to axiomatically establish the absolute character of rotation with the stated objective that GR should should demonstrate how the fundamental laws of physics ought to be the same in inertial and non-inertial frames of reference, whether the latter were revolving or under acceleration, Einstein, between 1908 and 1914, unsuccessfully attempted a treatment of gravitation that was compatible with a spatial, special theory. When the final of two such treatments emerged in 1915, Einstein claimed that it had been achieved at the cost of positing a new concept of the ether, and he put it five years later in Ether and Relativity. By retaining Oh, I wasn't done. Oh, my bad. By, reta- by retaining the speed of light as a cosmic invariant that also applied to gravitational fields. Here, hence, we find Einstein attacking the hollow and static ether. <clears throat> okay. Concepts of physics like Leonard, while invoking Mach to do that so. But and at the same time, we find him going beyond or astray of Mach's positions as well. <clears throat> The idea of the relativity of force, if stated in the form given by Mach, can be used only in connection with rotary motion. Einstein had to extend the idea in such a manner as to make it applicable to every motion. He achieved his aim through the principle of equivalence at the cost of turning Mach on his head and and admitting to an absolute rotation of space-time itself. Absolute rotation of space-time. As Einstein adapted it, Mach's principle became expressed in the fundamental GR notion of a curvature of space-time, Determined mechanically by the distribution of matter in the universe, one can no longer speak of distribution in space proper either, and the kinetic energy of motion of the bodies populating that universe, and determined axiomatically by considering by consideration of the intrinsic properties of the metric tensor. Einstein's concept of a curvature of space-time has been linked to Fitzgerald's imprecision, imprecise notion of gravity, which postulated that gravity resulted from a change in the structure of the ether caused by the presence of matter. Yet... As Whitaker has indicated, Fitzgerald was actually thinking of alterations in the dielectric constant and the magnetic permeability of the space surrounding the mass of a body. By analogy with the fact that in a liquid whose dielectric constant varies from point to point, an electrified body moves from places of lower to higher places of higher to places of higher dielectric constant. But Einstein's new theory of gravity in GR is elaborated in 1314 in two papers with the Swiss. Gra- with the Swiss, geo- Swiss geometer M. Grossman, 
replaces the Newtonian notion that gravity is a force operating on masses across empty and absolute space with the notion that gravity is a modification of the geometry of space-time. Einstein and Grossman suggest that the translatory motion of a particle in the free ether, but in the absence of any field, would be described by this. Thus proposing that the path of a body in free fall in a gravitational field is a geodesic in 4D space-time, with a metric defined by the quadratic differential equation, this. Hence, the gravitational field ceases to be the attribute of a single scalar potential function to become spe specified instead in tensor calculus by the 10 coefficients of g p, p sub p q, the gravitational potentials, which determine both the, sa the scale which determine both the scale of length in every direction and the length equivalent rate of clocks. Einstein was in fact operating a reduction of, scroll up just a little bit, Einstein was in fact operating a reduction of gravitational theory to geometry and precluding therefore any recourse to the notion of gravitational energy. It is indeed curious how the attempt at a general theory by Einstein in 1915, which aimed at defining a new concept of the ether, ended up treat by treating the gravitational field as a mere question of geometry. Force in the Newtonian sense is no longer involved nor propagated. The body that falls or moves from one place to another only does so by the shortest route, the geodesic. The reduction of gravity to a metric of space-time effectively empties space of energy and permits exclusive identification of physical energy with the electromagnetic field. What the frick? <laughs> in defining the new physical characteristics of the continuum, instead of realizing that space devoid of electromagnetic energy is not space devoid of energy, Einstein defined formally the force of gravity as a mere geometric property of the fabric of four-dimensional space-time, ignoring thereby any possible functional treatment of gravitational energy as such. From our perspective, this was in all likelihood an inevitable and necessary mistake of GR. Despite Einstein's claim that we therefore arrive at the result the gravitational field influences even determines the metrical laws of the space-time continuum, the field remains conceptual conceptualizable only by the pseudo ramanian manifold, which on its own fails to analytically treat the difference in dimensionality between space and time, fails to differentiate between them as distinct manifolds, and fails to account for them as the intrinsic properties of energy and flux. To hold the field as determinant of the metric, where the metric is intervalar and the field a mere geometric extrapolation, effectively constitutes a method to empty both the field and the metric of energetic considerations. You can't have energy in it if it's just geometry. The problem harks back to the topological concept. Whoa. The, to the, the problem harks back to the topological concept of a continuum as it was first enunciated by special relativity. It does not even satisfy full consideration of matter as electromagnetic energy and the energy tensor of matter, even if matter is to be regarded as the principal part of the electromagnetic field, because it limits itself to the principle of addition of flattened dimensions. Gravity is geometry, and then you flatten the, flatten the space-time out. And although one, and although one might still hold as does GR, that the gravitational field transfers energy to that matter, or to paraphrase Einstein, gives it energy. Nonetheless, this gravitational field, too, becomes defined by the same principles of Gaussian geometry. The problem, we think, lies right at the heart of the relativistic concept of the continuum. Einstein's impetus to develop GR, his proposal of a ZPE continuum, his drawing attention to de Broglie's wave mechanics, and his several attempts at a unified field theory all betray his relentless search for continuous structures that would link the quantum discontinuities. In 1954, a year before his death, Einstein wrote to Besso, I consider it quite possible that physics cannot be based on the field concept, i.e. on continuous structures. In that case, nothing remains of my entire castle in the air, gravitation theory included, and the rest of modern physics. <laughs> Dang. Wow, what a quote. Yeah, we're definitely in his digging last that up later. Sorry. And in his last writing, the second appendix, appendix to the meaning of relativity, Einstein distanced himself from attempts at quantization that reduced to a statistical theory of field probabilities, treating essentially nonlinear phenomena by, by linear methods, even though he also acknowledged the possibility that quantization itself might yet disengage an algebraic theory which could preclude his complex tensor theory of a continuous field. Most institutional physicists today see this as a recognition by Einstein of the more epiphenomenological reality of a continuum. continuum. Yet Einstein's admission of failure related quite specifically to a field theory of the continuum, not necessarily to, necessarily to any theory of the continuum. 
It is not our objective in the present communication to provide alternative views to those of relativity. While we have misgivings concerning special relativity's approach to the problem of the manifold, specifically regarding the spatialization of time as a condition for its geometric treatment, the proposed geometrism also suffers from intrinsic or imminent difficulties. By the time that the problem is formulated as a mere matter of flat topology, and that alone, energy dynamics has been expurgated. The very demonstration of the equivalence of inertial and gravitational mass, what Einstein once called an astonishing fact, <clears throat> falls short of its objective and manages to address what is solely a formal distinction, since it is the same, scroll up. Oh, sorry. Since it is the same mass that freely falls in a gravitational field and that resists changes in motion. Indeed, no real understanding of force, whether inertial or weighty, can be forthcoming unless one succeeds in treating the gravitational field as a continual exchange of graviton particles, be they quantic or subquantic. One could then grasp a physical sense to the dual reality of inert mass, seat of inertia and mass energy, and gravitational mass, seat of the graviton energy at, as a necessary double of inertial mass. And one may then, at last, come to where W. Reich stood when he enunciated the dimensional equivalence between mass and length. When the gravitational pendulum has long demonstrated, which the gravitational pendulum has long, has long demonstrated, but our understanding has failed to grasp. Indeed, an atom of mass energy by gaining a graviton does not thereby gain twice its mass, but only affects to its mass a wavelength that defines a characteristic graviton unit associated with it in every gravitational field and independently from local values of g. Alas, no topological treatment of an equivalence, ma equals mg. That remains obscure, could replace an energetic approach that construed graviton energies from first principles and bench experiments. But this is a matter that we leave for another occasion. The null geodesics are the tracks of rays of light. When Einstein created his new general theory of relativity in which gravitation was taken into account, he carried over this principle by analogy and asserted its truth for gravitational fields. Strictly speaking, there are no rays of light. That is to say, electromagnetic disturbances which are filiform or drawn out like a thread, except in the limit when the frequency of the light is infinitely great. In all other cases, diffraction causes the rays to spread out. E. Whitaker, A History of the Theories of Ether and Electricity, Volume 2, page 165. Here's the dragging of space-time thing. I don't know how much longer this is, but... Yeah, let's take a see, look see how... here. You pretty much crushed this thing. God, it goes on forever. Oh my gosh, dude! These guys are. Yeah, you went. You know. read way further into it than I did. I stopped way up at the top. <laughs> There's That's some crazy cool. quotes in here, and they're basically Einstein took the ability of like the gravitational field to hold energy out of it because he just made it merely uh, a geometric configuration of basically everything's like seeking the shortest, easiest path, just like just like electricity does. But the gravitational field has not actually got energy in it. It's not that it's like applying a force or carrying energy to stuff. It's that the path itself through which the stuff has to travel to get somewhere is shortening. And it's following that path. And so that we, it appears to move. It appears <laughs> to like have a force exerted to move. But really it's just that it like fell into a shorter path. And yep. to us as observers <laughs> within the frame, it looks like motion. But it didn't apply to the electricity part, though, because within the same frame, the same region of space, there's still an electric frame that has energy in it. Uh. Yeah, I don't want to read part three. I'm going to go to bed, but... I don't want to read it. <laughs> so, <laughs> good night. What'd you say? I said, I'm not going to read it either, so, good night. <laughs> <laughs> At least not mm. right now. Dude, that was, that was wordy. Yeah, dude, it, it, it got super lengthy, man. Like I said, I tapped out <clears throat> like way up here. So, <laughs> Did, What was that freaking quote that you highlighted in blue about Einstein saying that before he, a year before he died, like all of physics? Yeah, in 1945, a year before his death, Einstein wrote to Besso, I consider it quite possible that, that physics cannot be based on the concept or on the field, the field concept. concept i.e. continuous yeah. structures. In that case, nothing remains of my entire castle in the air, gravity, gravitational theory included, and the rest of modern physics, which adopted all of that. 
Wow. Because right? at this point, they had already, I'm almost positive they had already incorporated GR into Quantum. Or, like, tried to, anyway. Like, yeah. Like, this was all going on at the same time. Huh. Well, we got to page 37, the end of page 37, boys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks Holy for reading. Holy smokes. Hope you, uh, yeah, gonna go ho- hope you got your fill on Mickelson, Gale, Pearson, <laughs> and then Relativity Pass Theory. Out. I think that they needed to predict a full fringe because... In in their metric or in their uh, in general relativity, they couldn't have a partial fringe because there's no ether, and the only reason for a partial fringe would be because there was a drag of the ether in relation to everything else, because the ether would be like an absolute frame or whatever. Uh, so they could only have a one for one, uh, like uh, with the with the um. With the rotation. So the rotation should always be one for one with whatever the angular velocity is. Or so the sorry, the fringe caused by the rotation should always be one for one with whatever the velocity of the earth was based on the fringe formula. But the ether theory would predict that it could be less due to the ether not being like stationary or not being a, one like perfectly dragged, but having a partial drag. Um, and it, they had the, made the opposite prediction that they did for Mickelson Morley. Uh, but I still don't understand the, the, uh, like the, the symmetry stuff. I'll have to dig into that later. Word. All right, man. I should have slept like three hours ago, but you know what? Whatever. I will just suffer a little bit tomorrow and pass out. Yeah, cool. All right. Thanks. Later, G. Take. That was a cool paper, though. We'll finish it up later. And we got the the quote from that uh, guy 